What if Adolf Hitler had won the nuclear arms race? What if his V1s and V2s weren't carrying high explosive, but a deadlier cargo, a nuclear warhead? What would have happened then? Who would have won the war? It was a scenario that terrified the Allies. So eyes turned to SOE, the Special Operations Executive, and a group of highly trained Norwegian agents. Their epic story of survival and determination in Norway's most unforgiving landscape became the stuff of legend. But behind them was a rich and powerful financier, Charles Hamro. His role has remained largely unknown until now. The banker and these Norwegians held the future of the free world in their hands. The question was, could Hambro and his men stop the Germans in time and avert a calamity? Charles Hambro didn't fit the stereotype of a shadowy spymaster. In fact, he was the sort of man who stood out in a crowd, even from an early age. Captain of cricket at Eton, he first made his name in 1915 when he took six Winchester wickets for seven runs in the Winchester Eton match. He served with distinction on the battlefields of World War I, and further honours followed. Highly distinguished career in the war against the Kaiser military across the Coast Stream Guard before he came of age. He was an outdoorsman, an excellent shot, and a lover of field sports. Hambro was physically impressive too, standing at over six feet tall. And he also had friends in high places. He was also incredibly wealthy. For Hambro owned the bank that bore his name. It meant that Charles Hambro was so rich, he refused to accept any salary for his wartime work, which began in 1940. Hambro worked for the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Its goal, in the words of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, was to set Europe ablaze and strike back at the enemy using sabotage, propaganda, and subversion. In November 1940, he became controller of SOE's Scandinavian section. It was a fitting posting. He had relatives in Norway who saw firsthand what Nazi occupation was like. At this stage, Hambro led his section by example. He went into the field and personally conducted an intelligence gathering trip to Sweden in 1940 to meet contacts. There, he created a network that would last the entire war. But then in May 1941, a dossier arrived on his desk. It contained information smuggled out of Norway. The contents were extremely worrying. The documents Hambro received were emblazoned with two simple words, heavy water. It sent a shiver down his spine. The seemingly harmless name signified a key component in a weapon with unheard of power, the nuclear bomb. At this stage, the Germans were ahead in the race to make the atom bomb, but what they needed was plutonium. Only minute trace amounts of plutonium occur in nature, so it must be created in a reactor 
using naturally occurring uranium. Uranium is bombarded with neutrons and is refined into plutonium. But in order to achieve this, the Germans needed to find a suitable breaking material that could control the speed of the whole process. Heavy water, deuterium oxide, was this crucial missing link in the process to manufacture a nuclear bomb. It allowed plutonium production to occur in a controlled and safe manner. But heavy water took a long time to refine and produce, as water had to be electrolyzed as part of the production process. Once the Germans had sufficient plutonium, it could be used to make a so-called atomic core. This material would be encased in a sphere of high explosive. On detonation, a focused implosion occurred, which created a chain reaction within the plutonium of such force that its atoms were split, releasing huge amounts of energy. The Germans were making heavy water here, at the Norsk hydro plant, in the Telemark region of Norway. Nominally, its purpose was to manufacture fertilizer. To do that, you need two key elements in abundance, water and electricity. It just so happened that the byproduct was heavy water. Ambro had to devise a plan, and fast. The problem was, Professor Leif Tronstar, the man who had first warned SOE about the Germans' ambitions for heavy water, had fled Norway. He was now in Britain, serving in the Norwegian army in exile. So the first task was to find out more about what was going on at the plant. Then a stroke of luck. In March 1942, the steamer, Kaltusun, was captured and sailed to Aberdeen by Norwegian resistance men. 23-year-old Einar Schinelan, an engineer from the Norsk Hydro Factory, was aboard. And he was immediately snapped up by SOB, trained as a parachutist, put back by parachute with a wireless set. He was dropped back into Norway in late March 1942. Shinala now became Hambro's most important SOE man in the field. And soon he was smuggling out plans from the plant, hidden in toothpaste tubes. Then in May 1942, Hambro was made executive head of SOE. He no longer dealt predominantly with Scandinavia, but ran the whole of SOE. The heavy water problem remained the most important of the unit's mission slate. And Hambro took a personal interest. In the summer of 1942, the Allied High Command decided to act. Step one, they would take out the plant and the Germans' growing stock of heavy water. They concluded that a sabotage raid was the best way to stop production and a German nuclear bomb. Step two, Operation Lurgan was launched, named after a favorite Hambro hunting spot. This was the plan for a large raiding force to be infiltrated into Norway. However, it required a small reconnaissance force on the ground. where Hambro and SOE came in. A formal memo was passed to an anonymous sounding section of SOE, known as SN. SN was SOE's Norwegian section. It stated that Operation Lurgan had become their number one priority. 
SN section could call upon a highly specialist unit. SN, the Norwegian section of the SOE, had recruited some remarkable young men. It was manned almost exclusively by Norwegians. Large, healthy outdoorsmen brought up to ski from childhood. The Norwegians have a great tradition of outdoor life, of skiing um, and survival skills. And what they had in, in their section were probably the, some of the finest uh, examples of this. It included Company Linga, an elite unit from the Norwegian army in exile. You didn't get into the SOE if you were you're not up to speed, and you didn't get into Company Ling unless you were up to, you were something special. So they were remarkable young men. Hambro knew these were men he could depend on. Thoroughly skilled with weapons also, and awkward men to meet on a dark night. Hambro's intelligence source, Professor Leif Tronstad, had become a major supervising the trusted outfit. Four men from Company Linga will be selected to serve as the SOE advance party. They would have their own special code name, and typically for the sportsman Hambro, it was called Grouse. The team included Jens Poulsen, the leader, and Klaus Helberg, a native of the Telemark region, who had been in the resistance and had escaped from Norway in early 1942. Poulsen and his team were tasked with the all-important role of reconnoitering the landing zone and signalling in the main party. For Jens Poulsen, the idea of a single bomb of massive power was hard to comprehend. If the Germans got hold of the heavy water, they would be able to blow up some part of London. I didn't believe him. I think, you tell me this because you want us to do a, a, a good job. And I hadn't, I hadn't a clue of what heavy water was and how it was going to be used. Finally, on the 18th of October, Hambro gave the Grouse advance party the go-ahead. After months of parachute rehearsals, they were ready to be dropped in and reconnoitre the terrain for the main assault force. They were headed for the Hardanger Vida Plateau in southern Norway, 20 miles from the plant. It was one of the most inhospitable and extreme environments in the world. The plateau is high above sea level, and in winter, few ventured into the wilderness. It was perfect for the grouse team. Soon the plateau came into sight. The signal was given, and the men jumped. Happy landing in spite of stones everywhere. Snowstorms and fog forced us to go down valley. Operation can still be done with success. <laughs> Hambro could now inform the Combined Operations HQ that everything was in place and put the rest of Operation Lurgan into action. It involved a raiding force of 34 men from Combined Operations. Combined operations were conventional soldiers. These were commandos being landed by sea. They were naval personnel, obviously, taking across the channel or across to Norway, and, and Royal Air Force personnel providing the aircraft and the parachute training. So these were all soldiers, sailors, and airmen. The idea was to fly them in by glider, but it was very high risk. The use of gliders on such a mission was relatively new. The gliders needed a larger aircraft as a tug and required huge skill from the pilots to land. They could carry only a strict payload of men and stores and were dependent on finding a suitable landing zone. The glider-borne troops were a new development uh, at that stage in the war. The gliders themselves were made out of plywood, quite fragile. Um, but of course, with the glider, once you're, you put the, the controls forward and you're going down, 
there's no going back, you're committed. And moreover, even, even if everything goes according to plan, landing a troop-carrying glider is basically a controlled crash and guys can get killed and injured, even under the most ideal conditions. On the 19th of November, the Grouse team heard a crackled message from London. The password, girl, meant that the glider party was on its way. But the mission would not go according to plan. Delay after delay, a victim getting it ready. And in the end, two Halifaxes set off, each towing a glider. The gliders and their tugs took off on the night of the 19th of November. Of those four aircraft, only one returned. One glider crash landed near the Norwegian coast. The cause, frozen towing cables which had snapped, forcing the glider down. The other glider and tug crashed into a mountainside in Norway. The survivors from both accidents were captured and executed. And the Germans got to the wreck. Some people were still alive whom they took away and murdered. They found on an officer's body a map of the target. So they knew where the party had been heading. That accounted for the explosives that were in the gliders also. During the next day, we heard from the headquarters and we understood that there had been a disaster. The Germans knew the plant was the target and upped security, as radio reports from the time suggest. Valley crawling with Germans, 900 troops stationed there. The Grouse team were now cut off and isolated. They had to hide. Back in London, Hambro was ordered to salvage the situation and was instructed to take personal charge of the whole operation. SOE had to try again. So he came up with Operation Gunnerside, this time named after his favorite Scottish hunting lodge. This was a plan to increase the meager force on the ground and send more Norwegian SOE agents from Company Linger to join the others. The Gunnerside team was led by Joachim Runeberg. It included Knut Horkelai and four others. Again, they came from Hambro's best agents in SN section. And they soon formed a close-knit band, as Joachim Ronneberg explains. You met with people you hadn't known before, and, and, and you felt that you had to work as a team. Uh, and and you, you, you built friendships that, well, even today, they are very, very strong. As they waited for the Gunnerside team to reach them in Norway, the Grouse team tried to cheer up their bosses at SOE HQ. A message to Hambro simply reads, keep up your hearts, we will do the job yet. On the 16th of February, 1943, Gunnerside finally went in. The goal, to meet up with Grouse and take down the plant. In London, Hambro followed every development. The men made it, but were dropped off target. The problem now was finding the Grouse team in the snowy wilderness. They could be anywhere in the two and a half thousand square miles of the plateau. Both teams up on the plateau, times were hard, with limited rations and relentless exposure to the elements. Finally, on February the 23rd, contact was made between the two groups. It was a very, very happy meeting. And of course, they were very happy to to have a feeling that now things are going to happen. The 
two teams now had to plan the attack. The challenges facing them were immense. The Germans knew they were coming. The area around the plant itself was in lockdown. 300 men were on guard. Anti-aircraft guns and searchlights had been brought in. There were even two radio direction finding stations attempting to track down the SOE teams. But the Germans had missed something. The railway line that ran to the plant was unguarded. The Norwegians could attack from there. They radioed Hambro in readiness for the attack. On the 25th of February, 1943, they moved to a base camp and set out on the 27th of February to sabotage the plant. Klaus Helberg recounts what happened that night. They started about uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. It was dark. We crossed the gorge with weapons and demolitions. The team's approach via the railway worked. They managed to get into the plant unobserved. Everything was quiet except the sounds from the factory. I was just standing there, waiting. The only one thing I was thinking was, what should I do if the German guard came? Should I let him pass? hide myself? Should I shoot? As some of the party kept guard, two men, including the leader, Ronneberg, laid the demolition charges. Was a release when I heard the explosion. It was not loud because this is inside a, a, a large concrete building. The attack had worked. It looked like the nuclear threat from Germany was over. It was a triumph. Now the saboteurs had to escape. All their training and outdoor skills had prepared them for precisely this moment. First, to evade the Germans, the route out required a grueling hike to the plateau. We could not go up the same way, because if we should go the same way, we had to follow the road for a long while and uh, we expected the Germans to come any, any time. Once back on the plateau, the teams now set out for safety. 
The route was through an area crawling with Germans. The teams trekked 400 miles on skis over 18 days, marking each stage with a small ceremony. We have 26 different maps. And every time on the trip, when we had finished using a map, we could hold it up and light it and see it burning. And it was a great one less. Finally, on the 18th of March, they crossed the border with Sweden. It was a glorious end to the mission. In London, Hambro seemed to have presided over a faultless SOE operation. It looked like his crowning achievement. He immediately sent back a message for the team. Heartiest congratulations on excellent work done. But not all the demolition party headed to Sweden. Knut Horkelai stayed behind. He remained Hambro's eyes and ears on the ground. Horkelai watched the German search parties from the safety of the plateau. His radio message described their frustration. They behaved like hooligans in the extreme. Everything usable in the huts was stolen and four huts were destroyed. The Germans shot with automatic weapons at reindeer herds. Despite the Germans' antics, Horkelei remained safe, patiently transmitting news to home station in England, exactly as instructed. But soon, Horkelei was on the wires again, and this time, it was bad news. The messages made grim reading for Hambro. It seemed the attack had only delayed German production efforts at the Telemark plant. Within four months, the Germans were up and running again. By August, the stockpile was reaching dangerous levels. SOE would inevitably need to strike again. Then came another blow for Hambro. He fell out with the minister in charge of SOE, Lord Selborne. He worked closely with Lord Selborne. They used to meet daily. And one meeting Hambro went to was in his pocket a very awkward telegram that had just arrived from Yugoslavia, wondering whether to discuss it with Selborne. The other things quite important were going on, so he left it to talk about another day. Selborne was summoned that night by Churchill to a meeting of ministers at which this particular telegram was discussed and sent for Hambro and said, why did you not tell me about this? And Hambro had to confess. He was frightfully sorry he'd had in his pocket. He didn't think it was quite right. Hambro and Selborne remarked, Charles, you'll have to go. Out he went. He resigned from SOE in September 1943 after three years of loyal service. But the heavy water problem still remained. Drip by drip, the German stockpile was increasing. So to tackle the continued threat, the Allied command tried a new approach. Where the SOE irregulars had failed, the massed ranks of the conventional forces were going to show them how to get the job done. On the 16th of November 1943, 150 Flying Fortress bombers took off from airfields in Britain. The target, the Norsk Hydro Plant. The bombing raids dropped 400 tons of high explosive.
A small Norwegian town nearby was also hit. But the raid itself was a failure. It only slightly disrupted production. And 22 Norwegian civilians were killed. Then, news came to SOE in London that was really alarming. The Germans planned to ship all the industrial equipment and the remaining stocks of heavy water to Germany. If the Germans were doing that, they must be close to perfecting a viable bomb. And once it was in Germany, there would be no chance of destroying it. Worse still, the Germans were making advances in ballistic missiles, a delivery method perfect for a nuclear weapon. The V-1 missile and V-2 rocket were both well advanced. V-2, which we couldn't intercept, traveling at a mile a second as it descended, could have accommodated a German nuclear weapon very easily. There was now real danger. So the Allies turned again to SOE. SOE knew exactly who to call. Knut Horkelai, the man Hambro had left in the field. He remained the only SOE agent in that region of Norway. Horkelai quickly established that rail wagons would transport the drums of heavy water as cargo down the valley. This load was due to be carried on the Norsk Hydro Ferry on the 20th of February, 1944. A large supply of heavy water left the factory on its way to Berlin to go by train, ferry, train, ferry, train, getting across a lake to start with in Norway and then across the Sound and then through Denmark to Berlin. Horkelai worked out that the first ferry was the weak point and the best bet to destroy the deadly cargo. Aided by local accomplices, he calculated the exact moment to strike. He would blow up the ferry at the deepest point in the fjord. This would mean the barrels could never be salvaged by the Germans. There was one problem. On board the ferry would be Norwegian passengers using the ship to cross the fjord. That meant innocent civilian casualties. But deciphered messages from SOE to Horkelai confirmed it was worth the risk. It was thought to be a price worth paying to stop Hitler getting an atomic bomb. On the night of the 18th of February, 1944, the Germans were guarding the rail wagons at a nearby siding. So Horkelai snuck aboard the ferry. Just before the ferry left across the lake, a chap got onto it in a brown coat with his mate, explaining there were some important last-minute adjustments to be made in the engine room, went down to the engine room, came out again, leaving his haversack behind him. In that haversack was an ingenious device. He'd improvised a charge using two alarm clocks. In this case, what you'd have is you'd have a battery wires to the, the hands, and as they came round, at the set time they would make contact, send an electric pulse down the wire to the electric detonator and set off the charges. What he worked out was putting it in the bow of the ferry. If he made a hole in the bow, the ferry would keep moving forward, and this would push the water in, and it would sink. The Germans had never thought to guard the ferry and they loaded their cargo the next day. The ferry left just after 9.45. At 10.30, the charge detonated, exactly as planned. 
the ferry quickly sank and disappeared to the floor of the fjord. Hitler's entire stock of heavy water was gone. This time, SOE really had succeeded. They had scuppered Hitler's plans for a nuclear weapon. It is over. The war in Europe is ended. In this headquarters on the 8th of May, the final unconditional surrender has been ratified. In southern Germany, Allied troops move forward to complete the occupation of the country. It was only after the war that the Allies uncovered just how close the Nazis had come to making a nuclear bomb. They discovered the Germans' plant in Bavaria, which had been made with the equipment salvaged from the Norsk Hydro Factory. The Germans were just a couple of drums short of the heavy water they needed. Had they been able to make just a little bit more, the war might have ended very differently. However, it was the Americans who won the race. The Manhattan Project, the US plan to create a nuclear bomb, succeeded to devastating effect at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One man in particular could savor the victory, Charles Hambro. After being removed from his job at SOE, Hambro had continued to be involved with his nuclear arms race. He played a significant part in the Manhattan Project. In the last months of the war, Hambro became responsible for passing the high-level nuclear research documents between the British War Materials Mission, based in Washington, D.C., and their American allies. After the war, he eventually returned to civilian life and the world of business. But thanks to him and the Norwegian team of saboteurs, Hitler was prevented from realizing his nuclear ambitions. I can't help concluding that every way I look at the evidence, every way I hold it, it was of cardinal importance. Nine men in SOE stopped Hitler getting an atomic bomb. And if SOE did nothing else, that would justify it in the eyes of history. His SOE team had struck in time and pulled off one of the most remarkable achievements of World War II.